Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Inna alhamdulillahi ta'ala Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu Wa na'udhu billahi min syururi anfusina Wa min sayyiati a'malina Man yahdihillahu falamudillalah Wa man yudlil falahadiyalah Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah Wahdahu la sharika lah Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا صلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن أستقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Indeed, all praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him, we seek His assistance, and we ask for His, for, for His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evils of our own souls and from the evil consequences of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can misguide. And whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows to go astray in His misguidance, then we, we will not find anybody who can guide that individual. Indeed, my dear brothers and sisters, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And his slave and his final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came with a message of pure tawheed. To proceed, the best speech is the book of Allah. And the best guidance is the guidance of his messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The worst of all of the affairs in this religion are those newly invented matters. For indeed, every newly invented matter in this religion is an innovation. Every innovation is misguidance, and every misguidance is in the fire of hell. To proceed after having mentioned the Khutbatul Hajjah, that which I started with, is known as the Khutbatul Hajjah. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever he would deliver a speech, he would always address the Muslims, reminding them concerning what I have just reminded you upon. To proceed, it pleases me to be in front of you brothers and sisters here in Peterborough, discussing this very, very uh, important topic. And indeed, it's a topic which, subhanAllah, we are in need of discussing, we are in need of talking about, because it's a topic which is ruining the lives of our families, ruining the lives of our loved ones, destroying communities, destroying marriages. It's important to note, brothers and sisters, today, in this short space of time, we're not going to discuss everything concerning magic, we're not going to discuss everything concerning uh, the Sahir, the magician. So what I want to do insha'Allah is just focus on what I think to be the main points from where we can derive some benefit and then how we insha'Allah we can go away and try and protect ourselves, our families from these people and also from Sihar in general. Because this is a topic which we find a lot about in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam you're often going to hear me saying the messenger and then I want everybody to say sallallahu alayhi wasallam okay the messenger alayhi salam he said the miserly one the stingy one is the one who I am mentioned in his uh, presence and he doesn't say sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He doesn't ask Allah to send salat and salams on the Messenger alayhi salam. Likewise, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam one day he was very very happy. So the companions they asked him, they said, Why are you so pleased, Ya Rasulullah? He said that Allah has revealed to me that whoever sends salat and salams upon me one time, Allah will give him ten good deeds. Allah will raise him in uh, his rank ten times. Likewise, as the brother has mentioned, it's very important that we straighten our intentions. That we meet for the sake of Allah, we leave for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah jalla wa ala, He has angels which roam the earth and they look for gatherings of knowledge. 
people who are remembering the deen of Allah, they are talking about the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Prophet alayhi salam told us that when these angels they come, they come and they surround the people and they cover them with their wings and sakina it descends from Allah upon these people and then when these angels they return back up to Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questions them and Allah is more knowing Allah has knowledge of all things but he questions them where have you come from and the angels they say oh Allah we have come from a group of your slaves who are glorifying you and they are praising you and they are seeking refuge with you from your fire and they are asking you for your jannah and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him, have they seen my fire? And the angels say, no, oh Allah, they haven't seen your fire. Allah says, how would it have been if they had seen my fire? And then Allah asks, and have they seen my Jannah? Have they seen this Jannah? And the angels, they reply, no, oh Allah, they haven't seen the Jannah. Then the uh, angels, they, they tell Allah how these people seeking refuge from the fire and they want the Jannah. Allah says, bear witness, I have given them refuge and I've given them safety from that which they are seeking refuge from, i.e. the hellfire, and I will grant them that which they want, i.e. the Jannah. So we hope that this is one of those gatherings where the angels, they envelop us and the mercy descends from Allah. Again, we have to straighten our intentions. So to go into the topic, it's very, very important, brothers and sisters, that we look at the history of magic. It's very important that we look at the history of magic. But before we do this, I want to mention my sources. Where am I taking my knowledge from? Because it's very important. We don't just take knowledge from anybody who just sits on the stage with a mic. We have to know where this individual, he is taking his knowledge from. So we take our knowledge primarily from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After this, then I take my knowledge from one of my teachers who is Sheikh Adil ibn Tahir al-Muqbil. Now the job of Sheikh Adil in Saudi Arabia is to catch magicians. This was his job. He had a full-time job where he would catch magicians, they would bring them to justice and then they would behead them if they found them guilty. He was in this position for 30 or 40 years. 30 or 40 years, so he got to know exactly what the Sahir is about, exactly how the Sahir operates. And before they would behead these people, they would make them, show them how, that, how they do magic. So they would say, show us how you do magic and we might let you live. Show us how you became a magician, etc. Likewise, as the brother has mentioned, I also practice Ruqya. And Ruqya is the recitation of the Qur'an, recitation of uh, the du'as from the sunnah of the Messenger salam, upon a person who is possessed, upon a person who has evil eye, Ain or Nazar, as, as the uh, people from the Asian subcontinent they call it. Likewise, a person who has any health illness whatsoever. So these are my sources. These are my sources. When we look at the magic of, or the history of magic, the first thing that we want to look at is the Sihar from the time of the people of Babel. The magic from the time of the people of Babylon. The way these people used to practice their magic, brothers and sisters, was through astrology. So they would look at the movements of the stars in the sky. They would predict the movements of the stars. And they would worship the stars. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Qur'an. Concerning Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was a youth who grew up in the worship of Allah. However, his father was the one who used to make idols. And then the people used to worship these idols. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uh, preserved and He guarded Ibrahim alayhi salam from worshipping these idols. Ibrahim, He left His people and He went to the people of Babylon. And as, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al An'am, which is the sixth surah of the Quran, these people, they used to go out into an open field and they used to pick stars. So one of them, he would pick that star and say, this is my God. And then another one, he would pick another star and he would say, this is my God. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, they didn't know who he was. So he went amongst them. And he said, you know that star over there? Yeah, that one, I'm going to worship that one. That's my God. But then, afala, falamma afala, when it disappeared, when this star, it disappeared. Qala la uhibbul afilin. He said to his people, I don't love, I can't worship that which disappears. So he's saying, look, that star, 
It's there but then in the morning it disappears. How can I worship something which is there one second and it's not there the next second? Then Ibrahim the next night, he saw the moon rising and he said, this one, this is my God. This is bigger than the star. The moon is bigger than the star. So he pointed at the moon and said, I'm going to worship this one. Then when the moon disappeared, when the sun rose, Ibrahim السلام, said again, O oh people, if Allah doesn't guide me, I'm going to go astray. Because again, the moon has disappeared. And then the, the next morning, he saw the sun rising in all of its glory. And he said, this is Hada Rabbi Hada Akbar. This is my Lord, this is the biggest out of all of them. The sun is bigger than the moon, it's bigger than those stars, look how much it shines in the, in, the, in the sky. But then when the sun disappeared, he said, Oh my people, indeed I am free from that which you associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we also find in the books of the magicians that the people, as we have mentioned, they did this astrology and we're going to mention concerning this later on. That was the people of Babylon. Then we have the people of Egypt. Concerning the people of Egypt, their magic, ya ikhwan, brothers and sisters, was a magic which was illusionary magic. Illusionary magic and they used the hieroglyphics and the symbols that we see today. Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam, he came to Fir'aun. He came to Pharaoh and he said, O oh Pharaoh, I am a messenger from Allah. Let the children of Israel go with me. And Pharaoh said, why should I let them go with you? Musa salam said, I will show you a sign from Allah. So he put his hand inside of his pocket and then he took his hand out and his hand was shining like the sun. Pharaoh said, you know what Musa, you're just a magician. You are just a magician and I have magicians who are better than you. You Pharaoh, you Moses, you're just a magician. My magicians, they're stronger, they're more powerful, they're more learned than you. Let's arrange a showdown. You come, I'll bring my magicians, we'll have a competition. So then a day was arranged. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in a lot of detail. The magicians of Pharaoh, they said to Musa, they said, Oh Musa, are you going to throw first? Are you going to do your magic? Or are we going to do our magic? قَالَ أَلْقُوا Musa said to them, you people, you throw. You are the magicians, you throw. فَلَمَّا أَلْقَوْا سَحَرُوا أَعْيُنَ النَّاسِ When they threw, they bewitched the eyes of the people. They bewitched the eyes of the people. وَاسْتَرْهَبُوهُمْ وَجَاءُوا بِسِحْرٍ عَظِيمٍ And they struck terror into them and they presented a mighty magic. The point here, brothers and sisters, we're seeing a different type of magic. The people of Babylon worship the stars. The people of Egypt, this type of magic is a magic which makes the eyes see that which isn't really there. Musa alayhi salam, fa'awjasa fi nafsihi khifata Musa. Allah mentions that Musa, he began to feel some, uh, some terror or some fear in his heart. Because when these magicians, they threw them, their sticks and their staffs down, their sticks and their staffs began to move like snakes. They began to move like snakes. Musa begins to feel a little bit scared now. What's going to happen now? Their staffs are moving like snakes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals into Musa, reveals to Musa alayhi salam, قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْأَعْلَى don't worry, O oh Musa, you're going to be victorious. You're going to be the one who is victorious. Throw what is in your right hand, throw your staff. Indeed, what they have done is just one of the works of a magician. The magician will never ever be successful. Doesn't matter what level he reaches. So to continue the story, Musa alayhi salam, he throws down his staff and his staff becomes a real snake. Remember sisters and remember brothers, that the magic or their staffs, they weren't real snakes. They just bewitched the eyes of the people. But when Musa threw his down, it became a real snake and it swallowed up their staffs. Then what happened? Subhanallah. فَأُلْقِيَ السَّحَرَةُ سُجَّدًا قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ هَارُونَ وَمُوسَى 
those magicians who just a second ago had been working for Pharaoh, just a second ago had been fighting against Musa, when they saw what happened when Musa alayhi salam threw his staff down, they fell down prostrate and they said, we worship the God of Musa and Harun. They became Muslims from being the enemies of Allah, from being the enemies of Musa alayhi salam, straight away in an instant when they saw what had happened, they embraced Islam because they knew what we did, it was magic. But what he has bought, it's not magic. He has to be a messenger from Allah. Then we have the magic we in our times today. Take it as a principle, brothers and sisters, the magic of our time, it uses and it may combine all of these different types of magic. You might have numbers, you might have grids, you might have astrology, you also might have illusionary magic. So the magic that we have today, it may be a combination of one or all of the different types of magic that we have uh, in, in history. And I want to mention something and I want you to keep it in your mind. No magician, no magician knows about Islam except that he uses Islam to practice his magic. Okay, take this as a principle. No magician knows about Islam except that he uses Islam to practice his magic. Now this may seem absurd. How is somebody going to use the book of Allah to practice magic? How is somebody going to use the sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, to practice magic? But we're, as we're going to see, they disgrace the book of Allah. They mock and disgrace the sunnah of the Prophet salam, seeking to come closer to the shayateen. Linguistically, when we talk about sihr, when we talk about magic, we need to define our terms. What does it mean? Linguistically, it means that which is caused by hidden or unseen forces. Magic, linguistically, it means something which is caused by hidden or unseen forces. Just as an example, to make it clearer to you brothers and sisters. Imagine you're in an open field. You're in an open field and there's nothing else around you. But you can feel there's a, a breeze which is blowing. You can't see the breeze, but you're feeling the effects of the breeze. Likewise with sihar, you can't necessarily see the magic, but it takes an effect and it has a toll on your body and also on your mind. Istilah and technically when we talk about sihar, it is, and this is very important. Magic is a contract between the magician and one or more of the shayateen. Magic is a contract between the magician and one or more of the devils where the magician does acts of worship, where the magician does acts of worship to those devils and in return they do something uh, for him. Okay, it's a contract. I need you to remember this. It's a contract. The jinn won't just work for the magician just because he asks them to. Rather, he has to worship them. He has to come close to them. Before they do anything for him, he has to show his undying obedience to those shayateen. He has to show complete love and complete submission for those devils before they do anything for him. Now, we're going to look at magic as it is mentioned in the Quran in a very very key place in Surah Al-Baqarah ayah number 102 and the ayah starts وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah he tells us a lot about magic tells us concerning some of the purposes of magic explains to us is there good magic something we have in our communities is there good magic Oh, my husband, he doesn't love me, so I'm going to go and get magic done on him to make him fall in love with me. My wife, she can't have children, so we're going to get this type of magic done to try and uh, make us have children, to try and make her conceive a child. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us very clearly, And they followed instead what the devils at the time of Sulaiman recited. وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانِ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ But Sulaiman alayhi salam, this is the Prophet Sulaiman. Why does Allah mention Sulaiman? 
Because the Jews, the Jews, what they used to do, they used to practice magic and say it was Sulaiman who practiced magic. We are only following in the footsteps of our Prophet, our Messenger. So Allah is saying, the Jews in reality, they followed what the devils at the time of Sulaiman recited. But Sulaiman did not disbelieve, but the devils disbelieved by teaching the people magic. Okay, are we all together so far? Allah is saying, Allah is refuting them, saying, the devils, they are the ones who taught magic. Sulaiman, he didn't teach magic. Okay, they taught the people magic. Okay, then in the next part of the ayah, وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ بِبَابِ لَهَا رُوتَ وَمَا رُوتَ And also what came down to the two angels of Babylon, Harut and Marut. وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرُ These two angels, they descended at Babylon and they started to teach the people magic. Now we have a question. If magic is so evil, how is it that two angels began to teach the people magic? Why did angels come down? Why did Allah send angels down to teach the people magic? Allah says, they did not teach anybody. They didn't teach anybody this magic until they had first warned him and said, look, innama nahnu fitna. Indeed, we are a trial. We're a test from Allah. Fala takfur. So don't disbelieve. In other words, if you learn this magic from us, we will teach it to you. But know that if you learn it, this is disbelief. Okay, this is very, very important. Now we're getting what's the reasons for why people do magic. Allah says, they learn from those two angels, that by which they seek to cause separation between a husband and his wife. They learn magic to cause divorce between a husband and his wife. Allah is telling us about one of the reasons why people do magic. The most common reason why people do magic is because they want to separate you from your wife. They want to separate you from your husband. Out of jealousy, out of hatred. Maybe you were supposed to marry his daughter and then you married somebody else. Now he's saying, you know what, we'll see if that marriage lasts. So he does magic on you to ruin your, ma your marriage. Maybe somebody is jealous of you and he sees that you're happy with your wife. So he does magic on you to ruin your marriage. Maybe somebody is just evil and he doesn't like you or there's some family problems. So they do magic on you to ruin your, mar your marriage and to separate and to cause divorce between husband and wife. So as the ayah is going on, as we're seeing, Allah is telling us more and more information about magic. So Allah tells us, they cause separation, they cause divorce by this magic. Next, a point of aqidah, a point of creed. وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ They don't harm anybody by this magic, except by the permission of Allah. This magic, it afflicts you, it causes you problems, only by the permission of Allah. Either Allah is testing you, or Allah is punishing you for some sins that you have done, or Allah wants to raise your rank in the Akhirah. This is a test from Allah. This is a punishment from Allah. So what do we do, brothers and sisters? We turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We turn back to Allah because the punishment or the test, this magic is happening with the permission of Allah. Who can raise it off of us is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next. وَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ They learn that magic which harms them and it does not profit them. Is there any such thing as white magic? Is there any such thing as good magic? Is there any such thing as magic which is going to have a good outcome? Allah is saying, they learn that, they learn that magic which harms them and it does not profit them. There's no goodness in magic, brothers. There's no goodness in it. Don't think that I'm going to practice magic. I'm going to get some goodness out of it. Let me relay a, a situation to you, which I come across all of the time. Sisters ringing me, crying. I say, what's the problem? They say, I did magic on my husband. Why did you do magic on your own husband? Because he didn't love me. 
He didn't love me. So I've done magic on him to make him fall, fall in love with me. I say, okay, so what's the problem? Now he has become disabled. Now he has lost his mind. Now he has left me. Now I've left, lost, lost my children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, they learn that which harms them and it does not profit them. Do you think you're going to disbelieve in Allah? Do you think you're going to disobey Allah? And then after all of that disobedience, after all of that disbelief, there's going to be a good outcome? So we say to the sisters, you made your bed, now you have to lie in it. You disbelieved when you did magic on your own husband. You knew that this was haram. You did something which only works by pleasing the shayateen. And now you think that Allah is going to allow you to have an easy life, a good life. The next part of the ayah. And they know, they know whoever practices magic, they know that who has any, anyone who has any part of magic, he has no portion in the hereafter. If you practice magic, or you get magic performed on somebody, or you learn magic, or you pay for magic to be done on somebody else, or you promote magic. Allah is saying, they know that anybody who has any part of magic, مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خلاق. He has nothing in the Akhirah. He's not going to have anything in the Akhirah except for the fire of hell. And then Allah continues, وَلَا بِئْسَ مَا شَرَوْ بِهِ أَنفُسَهُمْ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ What an evil price it is, that which they have sold their own souls, if only they knew. Magic, brothers, is selling your soul. The devils, like I said, they won't work for you until you do acts of worship for them. When you do acts of worship for them and obedience to them and coming close to them, then you have left the fold of Islam. Points of benefit from this ayah. From this one ayah. All of this that I've just mentioned is from one ayah. A single ayah in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. The first thing. Magic is a type of knowledge, okay? Magic, brothers and sisters, is a type of knowledge. You go to college, you go to university to study engineering, medicine, whatever it may be, you're seeking knowledge of a particular subject. Likewise, when it comes to magic, magic is a particular subject. People go out and they learn about magic. We're going to talk about how does a person become an, a magician later on, inshallah. The second thing, magic is an act of kufr. Kufr Akbar, it puts a person outside of the fold of Islam. Okay, when somebody practices magic or has it practiced on somebody else, there is no, you know, there's no Islam left for that individual. The next point, magic causes real harm. You know, people think, oh, this magic, this hocus pocus, it's not real. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in the Quran, through magic, a husband and wife divorce. Through magic, a family is destroyed. Imagine that. A man, he loves his wife and she loves him. And they are close. But then somebody performs magic on them. And as a result of that, they hate one another. They begin to argue. They don't like one another anymore. And as a result of that, by the permission of Allah, it re results in the breakup of their, magic, of their marriage. The next point. And I have to stress this because there are people in our communities who are practicing magic and people think that there's something such as good magic. Brothers, there is no such thing as good magic. All of magic is disbelief. All of magic is disbelief. The next point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah is refuting the Jews. Allah refutes the Jews because the Jews said, Sulaiman was the one who practiced magic, we're just following our messenger. Allah is saying, no, Sulaiman didn't do magic. You people, you learnt the magic from those shayateen, and you learnt the magic from those two angels who brought it down as a trial for you. Now I want to look at magic in the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We've looked at magic very briefly. There are other places where Allah talks about magic. But we don't have enough time to discuss those in detail. But we want to talk about magic in the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hadith that we're going to talk about is in Bukhari and Muslim. It's narrated by Imams Bukhari and Muslim. It's the most authentic type of hadith. When a hadith is reported by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, 
We say this is from the highest of authenticity. And it's reported by our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. She says that magic was done on the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Magic was done on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam until he had imagined that he had done something and he hadn't done it. Now the question is, Aisha radiallahu anha says magic was done on him until he imagined that he's done something and he hasn't done it. What was he imagining? What did the Prophet ﷺ imagine? What was going on that made her understand that there's something wrong? The Prophet ﷺ, when magic was done on him, he would wake up at around Fajr time, just before Fajr. And he would take a ghusl. He would take a ghusl. Aisha radiallahu anha, she understood this isn't from his sunnah. He doesn't normally do this. So she would ask him, why are you taking a ghusl? He would, he would say, we had relations. So I'm taking a ghusl, I'm bathing myself, I'm cleaning myself. So they hadn't had relations. When Aisha radiallahu anha is saying, he would imagine that he had done a thing, but he hadn't done it. What he was imagining, due to the magic, was that he had had relations with his wives. But he hadn't actually had any relations. One day, look at this, one day, he made dua. The Prophet alayhi salam, he made dua. The key thing if you are inflicted with magic is dua. That you raise your hands and you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you understand this affliction has only taken place by the permission of Allah. Therefore it's only Allah who can raise this affliction off of me. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, one day he made dua. And then he said, do you know that Allah has shown me where my cure lies? Do you know where, that Allah has shown me what is wrong with me? Look at this amazing incident which took place with the Messenger Wasallam. He says, two men came down. Two men they came to me. One sat at my feet and one sat at my head. These two men were angels. One came and sat at my feet and one came and sat at my head. And they began to speak, they began to have a conversation. And it was from the miraculous nature that Allah allowed the Prophet ﷺ to witness their conversation. So this one at the head says, what's wrong with this man? What's wrong with him? Imagine you have two doctors and the doctors, you're lying on the bed and the doctors are having a conversation, you can hear them. One of them says, what's wrong with this man? The other one says, he has had magic done on him. The other one says, and who did the magic? Then the next one replies, it was Labid ibn al-A'asam, the Jewish man. He did magic on the Messenger Wasallam. The next one, he says, how was the magic done? He says, from the comb of the Messenger, his beard hair that was on it. Where is the magic? In the well of Darwan. So the Prophet Wasallam, he sent Ali radiallahu an, he sent him to this well and they destroyed the magic and the magic was lifted off the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Key points, brothers and sisters, if the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam can have magic done on him, then what about me and you? He was the best of creation. He was the seal of all of the prophets and messengers. He had the best in terms of Iman, the best in terms of Tawakkul, the best in terms of his knowledge, the best in terms of his application of that knowledge, the one who loved Allah the most and the one who Allah loves the most. Yet he was afflicted with magic. So me and you, we have to be careful and we have to understand that nobody is immune from magic. Sometimes people come and they say, it's okay, I pray five times a day, I do my adhkar, morning and evening, I do my uh, dhikr of Allah, I am protected. We say, yes, you have done what's within your capability, but understand that one who was much better than you, infinitely better than you, he was afflicted with magic. The second thing, the Prophet ﷺ made dua. I can't emphasize enough the importance of dua. Dua, brothers and sisters, is your ultimate weapon against the devils. Dua is your ultimate weapon. When you stop giving, when you stop making dua, they have won. It's the sword of the Muslim. Dua is the sword of the Muslim, like the Messenger said. How was magic performed? 
magic was performed via the comb of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet ﷺ used to comb his beard. This was from his sunnah. He used to comb his beard. And as the brothers with beards, they will know when you comb your beard, inevitably some hairs, they come off. They come off and they wrap around that comb. So the Prophet ﷺ, he dropped his comb. This Jewish man, he took this comb and he did magic on the Messenger wasallam via this comb. We're going to look at the details of how somebody does magic on you a little bit later, inshallah. What's the punishment for the one who practices magic? In Islam, there is a very strong, stern punishment, the ultimate punishment. The Messenger wasallam said, the prescribed punishment for the magician is that he be executed by the sword. The prescribed punishment for the magician is that he should be executed by the sword. I don't want anybody to go and start executing their neighbors. Okay, and then say he was practicing magic. No. This is when we have a Muslim land, we have Muslim courts, we have evidence, we have all of these things. Okay, we don't take the law into our own hands like this. In a Muslim land, then yes, this individual, if he is caught, then he would be executed by the authorities. In fact, if you go on YouTube, it's very, you can watch it in Saudi Arabia, they are always executing magicians. They are always executing magicians in Saudi Arabia. Now the next question, look at the seriousness. We catch an individual who's practicing magic. So we say to him, you are practicing magic. And he says, I made Tawbah. I made Tawbah. What do we do with this individual now? Do we accept his Tawbah and let him go? Or do we carry out the punishment against him? What the scholars have mentioned, subhanAllah, is that we say to him, as for your Tawbah, if it is sincere, it is between you and Allah. As for in this life, because of the fitna and the destruction that you have caused, we're going to kill you. Okay? So even if we catch him and he claims to have repented, we say due to the evil of that which you have spread, in this life, we have to carry out the punishment against you. But your tawbah which you claim to have made, your repentance, which you're claiming you've made, that's between you and Allah. On the Day of Judgment, if you've repented and you're sincere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. Likewise, there was a companion by the name of Hudayfa. Hudayfa, an amazing companion. He sat there and there's an individual who is on the stage like we are and he's practicing magic. He's practicing magic. So like you brothers are sat there and there's a man in front of the people. What he's doing? He's in, he's bewitching their eyes and he's making it look like he's, his head is rolling off onto his shoulders. So he takes his head off and he rolls it down one arm. And then he rolls his head back up, puts it back onto his neck and then he rolls it down onto his arm and rolls it back on and puts it back up. He's bewitching the eyes of the people. Hudayfa, he stands up, climbs onto the stage, takes out his sword and cuts the man's head off. Cuts the man's head off and says, put your head back on if, if you are truthful. Put your head back on if you are truthful. The governor at that time in Iraq, he, uh, he put him into prison. He put the companion into prison. The Khalifa at that time was Uthman radiallahu an. Uthman, he heard about what happened. Uthman wrote a letter to the governor and said, release him because he has done well. Release him because he did well. In other words, he did well to kill that man. The point being, brothers and sisters, the serious nature of the magician. The serious nature, the serious trouble that he's going to be in if he is caught. How much Islam hates and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates the one who practices magic. Now we're getting into a very serious topic which is how does an individual become a magician? How does an individual become a magician? In reality, I've got lots of videos which I wanted to show to you brothers and sisters. But what I think we will do inshallah, I'll try and get these videos put up onto the Peterborough Dawah uh, Facebook page and you brothers and sisters can watch them. But let's talk in general because what I'm going to mention now, I'm sure you're not going to believe it. What I'm going to mention, I think it's so outrageous that perhaps there might be somebody who says, no, this can't be true. This can't be real. 
So that's why it's important that we watch the videos because we have video evidence of what these people do. The first thing, the first step in an individual becoming a magician. And I mentioned my sources and it's important that I tell you concerning my source for this as well. One of my sources, a brother used to be a magician. He went through all of these stages and it's incredibly rare for an individual to come back from magic. He's gone so far, it's very rare for him to come into Islam. But Allah guides who, whom He wills and He misguides whom He wills. Allah sends astray whom He wills and He guides whom He wills. So this individual relating the story. First hand, okay? So it's not something in a book, it's not something else, this is first hand and it's come from an individual who had to do this. The first thing brothers and sisters is that we need to understand the magician he needs to know that what he is doing is kufr. He needs to understand what I'm about to do, this journey which I'm embarking on to learn magic and practice magic, it's disbelief. It's disbelief. If he doesn't acknowledge this, then the magic is not going to work. Then the, the shayateen are not going to work for him. The first thing this individual needs to do usually is he needs to do what's known in our societies as a chilla. I'm sure people have heard of this. A chilla. I'll tell you, I talked to you about this. This individual, he goes into a cave. He goes into a, a place which is very desert, deserted and there's nobody around. And the brother he mentions, he says, I went to a cave and I drew a circle on the floor in this cave, which is in a remote location. I drew a circle on the floor and I sat in this circle for 40 days. I sat in this circle for 40 days and I was not wearing any clothes. In this circle, I used to eat. In this circle, I used to defecate. In this circle, I used to sleep in his own excrement. He says, when I reached the filthiest levels, worse than the animals, he says that the shayateen, they began to appear to me. The devils, they began to appear to me, to teach me elements of this knowledge. He says, so they taught me elements of magic, gave me like a taster. I said, I want more, teach me more, teach me more. They said, we are not going to teach you more until you go and commit zina a'udhu billah, until you go and fornicate. But not just any fornication. They said, you have to go and do this with either your mother or your sister. A'udhu Billah. So he says, I went and I did that. I went and I did that. And then they taught me a, a bit more concerning this knowledge. They gave me some more of this knowledge. And he said, every single day I would have to sleep. Brothers and sisters, they may live next to us. They may live on our streets. He says, every day I would fill my bath full of rubbish, full of excrement and then I would lie and I would sleep in this situation. I would lie in this bath which is full of rubbish and full of dirt, full of filth. This is how I have to live. These people who you see on TV, you know, Dynamo and Chris Angel and these other people, millionaires, they may be millionaires but you need to understand for them to be practicing magic they have to sleep in this situation. They have to live as a filthy, filthy individual. Otherwise, the shayateen, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to do anything for them. I had videos. I have videos on here. Other things that the magicians, they do. And I don't like to mention this, but we need to, we need to understand. They take the Qur'an. They take the Mus'haf, the Mus'haf, which we read from. They take the Qur'an and they throw it into the sewers. They take the Qur'an and they use it as toilet paper. A'udhu Billah. They take the Qur'an, they take the Qur'an and they rub it in menstrual blood. Brothers and sisters, this is their reality. And like I said, you probably won't believe me. I will show you the videos inshaAllah. We will put the videos onto the Facebook page. This is their reality. This is their reality. Likewise, they will sit in an enclosed space in the dark, burning Bukhur, and they will whip themselves. 
whip themselves like the Shia. Why? Why are they whipping themselves? Why is an individual doing this? Why is he sitting in this filth? Why is he doing this with his own sister? Why does he sleep in this situation? Brothers, what you have to understand, the devils, they want you to lower yourself. The same way we fall down prostrate to Allah. We don't prostrate to anybody but Allah. They want you to prostrate to them. The same way we break down and we raise our hands and we cry in front of Allah in the depths of the night, begging for His forgiveness, making dua. This is from worship. This is from worship. They, the shayateen, they want that individual to be the same. Total obedience from this man. Think about it. If a man is willing to eat his own excrement because he wants to learn magic, then of course he is somebody who is devoted. He is somebody who is, he is devoted to the cause. They will only teach you this magic if you are 100% devoted to this cause. Take it as a principle. Take it as a principle. Take it as a qaida. The shayateen, they will not work for an individual unless he calls other people to shirk. Okay? The magician, if he's in his front room worshipping the devils, his magic won't work. His magic won't work. The devils won't work for him until he starts to call other people to the worship of others besides Allah. Now in reality, he's not going, you're not going to go to this man and he's going to say, bow down in front of Iblis, bow down in front of that idol. No. Brothers and sisters, remember worship is more than just salah. Worship is more than just hajj. Worship is more than zakah. Worship is things like taking an oath by Allah. We don't swear on our mother's lives. We don't swear on our children's lives. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever swears by anything other than Allah has committed shirk. Think about this. Next time you want to swear on your kids' lives, next time you want to take an oath by your mother or by anything other than Allah, remember what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. You cannot raise your mother up to that station. Allah in the Quran, He swears by whatever He likes. He says, Wal Asr, Wal Fajr, Walayalin Ashr, Wal Shaf'i Wal Watr, Wal Shamsi Wal Duhaha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. He can take an oath by whatever He likes. He created everything. As for us, we only take an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the magician, like I mentioned, his magic won't work until he calls other people to shirk. So he will say to you, bring me, uh, bring me a sacrifice, bring me a goat, bring me a sheep and I'm going to sacrifice it. He'll take it to the graveyard and he'll sacrifice it at the graveyard. Or he's going to say to you, bring me a rat or bring me a mouse or bring me a cat and then he will sacrifice that to the shayateen. I had a video of a man who they caught and he was a magician and he describes and he shows how he takes a bird and he slaughters the bird to the devils and then what he does is he throws the bird up after he slaughtered it he throws it up straight away and of course the bird is still moving it's still temporarily alive and as it flaps its wings its blood covers him and the whole room and this is how he calls upon his devils and then he shows he shows the Sheikh, he shows how he sleeps in a position of prostration to the devils. He says, this is how I sleep and he sleeps prostrating to those devils. I don't want you to think that this happens in some caves in Arabia somewhere. This type of thing is in our societies, in our communities, it's in and around us as we speak. In and around us as we speak. It's not uncommon for the man to have a beard, to carry a Qur'an with him. But when he prays, he doesn't pray in wudu. I had one situation where, and I just give you these case studies and these examples in order for you to understand. This is real life, it's not some fantasy, not, for, not from books. A man, he divorced his wife and he had five daughters or seven daughters with this, in, with this woman. He said to her, all of your daughters are never going to be happy. So he would do magic on his own daughters. This man is a practicing man with a beard. They said he used to carry a Qur'an around with him. We took the Qur'an, we opened the Qur'an and his magic was in the Qur'an. He was carrying this Qur'an to show the people, I'm a holy man, I'm a holy individual. But he was doing magic and his magic was being done inside of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
I mentioned earlier, I said it's a principle. Nobody knows about Islam except that he will use Islam to perform his magic. And we're seeing what we're talking about now. Because he knows about this. This is the Quran. He knows this is the Quran. How can I get close to the devils? What's going to be the a route to get close to the devils? What do the devils hate the most? The book of Allah. So how do I get close to them? How do I please them? I disgrace the book of Allah. What do the devils hate most out of the men? The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what do I do? I mock his sunnah. I mock him. I mock his sunnah. This is how they get closer to the devils. This is how they use Islam in order to come closer to and to please the individuals, the shayateen. Never ever be fooled by an individual's outward appearance. He might have a beard, he might be wearing a cap, he might sound very pious. But we judge the individual not on his appearance, but in his adherence to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's so important. People, they come to me and they say, this man, he did X, Y and Z. And I said, look, where's your common sense gone? How did you allow this individual to do what he did to you? And they say, because he looked very pious. He looked practicing. He had Ayatul Kursi on his wall. He had, you know, he had a big beard. And I say, look, just that appearance, any man can grow a beard. Any man can put a hat on his head. We judge them according to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Shaykh Adil, hafizahullah, he mentions a story. He said, in Riyadh, we found an individual and somebody called us and said, this man, he is a magician. So we went and we investigated and we found that he was an individual who was practicing magic. So the question is, why did somebody grasp this man in to the authorities. Why did they expose him to the authorities? He says, we found in the back of his car a spade. We found in the back of his car a spade. So Sheikh Adil, he said, look, and he questioned us, and I'm questioning you. They found a spade. Why did the shayateen, the shayateen were the ones who exposed this man. There was an individual who was possessed, the, the, the shayateen who speak through the possessed person's body, they called the authorities, the shayateen, okay? And they told them, this individual, he's a magician. Why did the devils expose the magician? I have a question for you. Why did the devils expose this magician? It's linked to the, uh, it's linked to the, uh, the spade which was found in his car. Does anybody have any idea? Can anybody, I'm asking, this is an open question. They found a spade in his car, so he was clearly digging for something. Why did the shayateen expose this individual? We'll open it to the brothers. He was? So he was burying things. No, because the shayateen, they would be pleased with this. If he's burying his magic, they're pleased. They're happy with this. He's still performing his magic. Why is it in their interest to expose this individual? Why do the shayateen expose this individual? I'll tell you. Because this individual, he stopped calling other people to shirk because he used to charge a lot of money for his magic. So now, he stopped doing that and he started digging for gold instead. He started digging for gold instead. So those shayateen who were working for him, they ended up exposing that individual. This is what I was saying when I said, if the magician doesn't call other people to shirk, then the shayateen, they will stop working for him. They don't want anything to do with him. You want to worship in your house? You want to worship the devil? Go ahead. But you won't be able to become a magician until you start calling other people to magic. And likewise, your magic, it will only be as powerful as the amount of people you're calling to shirk. Do we understand this? The more people you call to associate partners with Allah, the more powerful, the more famous you will become. So brothers and sisters, when you see people like Dynamo, when you see people like Chris Angel, when you see people, Chris, uh, David Blaine, you have to understand, if these individuals are magicians and what they are practicing is real magic, then they will only have got this far because they are calling other people to shirk. They are calling other people to shirk. How are they calling other people to shirk? 
Other people genuinely believe that this man, he can move from there to there. Other people genuinely believe that you have a card and you're standing all over there and he has this knowledge, this knowledge of the unseen. He can't see your card, but he knows what's on your paper. This is shirk. This knowledge is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When people, they start to attribute this to others besides Allah, they are falling into shirk. They are pleasing shaitan. Brothers, what's the aim of shaitan? What's the aim? The aim of shaitan is to take as many of us with him to the hellfire. This is his aim. He's not your friend. He's not your helper. He's not an advisor to you. The aim of shaitan is to take as many of the children of Adam with him to the fire on the day of judgment. And he knows because Allah said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah will never forgive the one who commits shirk with him. But he forgives what is less than that for whomsoever he wills. Shaitan knows, if I get this man to murder this one, on the day of judgment, Allah may forgive this individual if Allah wills, out of his mercy. But if I can get this one to commit shirk, and he dies upon shirk, then this man, he will never be forgiven. So it's like the fast track into the hellfire. So shaitan, he wants to get people to commit shirk. And the magicians, they are one of the main ways that people, they fall into shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did we say concerning the magic? We said the magic is a contract between the magician and one or more of the shayateen. I want to look at now, brothers and sisters, how does a magician do magic? So we have person X. Person X goes to the magician and he says, you know, Abdullah over there, I want him to, uh, you know, I want to ruin his marriage. I want to kill him. I want to destroy him. He's got money. I want him to lose it. The magician will say, okay, bring me either some of his hair or bring me an item of his clothing. Bring me his underwear. If it's a woman, bring me her jewelry, bring me some shoes, bring me a picture, bring me something with their DNA on it. You know the DNA that we have, bring me something with this on it. So the individual, they will take, a, they will take an item of clothing, they will take a picture, whatever it is. The magician will say, okay, that's fine. So now the magician, in the night time when everybody else is asleep, he goes and he starts to worship the devils as we have mentioned. Starts to make this dhikr of them, this you know, dhikr of shaitan. And he begins to call upon them, make dua to them. They then begin to appear to him. So they appear to him and they say, look, what do you want? What can we do for you? Then he will say, this, this is Abdullah. Here's his clothes. Here's his jewelry. Here's her jewelry. Here's an, a, a, a part of his hair, whatever it might be. Like the Jewish man did to the messenger sallallahu Here is this. The devils will then say, right, if you want us to destroy this man's ma marriage, then we want you to sacrifice a sheep to us. We want you to bow down to us. We want you to do this and do that. The devil, the, the magician, he will do that. Then he, will call, then he will call person X and he will say, right, here is some, here is some powder. And he does magic and he calls up on the devils and he does his spells on the powder. He will say, here is some powder. Take this powder, put it in his tea. Take this powder, put it into his food. Take this powder, give him a drink. So one of the ways magic is done is through food. Another way, he will say, here is a da'weed, here is an amulet. Take this amulet, hang it outside of his house. Here is an amulet, hang it on a tree. Here is an amulet, throw it into his front garden. This is another way. Or he is going to say, bring me a chicken. And he brings a chicken. The magician slaughters the chicken to the devils. He does his magic on that chicken. Then he will say, take this chicken, throw it into his back garden. Take this chicken, throw it onto, into his front garden. Or he will do magic on some blood. On some blood. So he slaughtered, he's got, gathered the blood, he does his magic on the blood. He will say, take this blood, sprinkle it on his door, sprinkle it on his doorstep, sprinkle it on his, on his car or something like this. So many different ways of doing magic. Or he will say, 
and he will do magic on an egg, a chicken's egg. And he will say, take this egg and smash it on his front door. Take this egg and, and throw it onto, onto, into his garden or whatever it may be. So many different ways. Or he will say to you, take, give, bring me a string and he will tie knots onto the string. Okay? Surah Falaq وَمِن شَرِّ النَّفَّةِ ثَرْتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ Allah tells us to seek refuge from the evils of those who blow on the knots. How does he blow on the knots? You know when we talk about blowing on knots, let's talk about it in some detail. He takes a string or he takes a cloth and he ties a knot. Then he calls upon the devils. So he might say, Ya Iblis or whatever calls upon them. Blows upon those knots. Now understand this. If I take a knot, I take a piece of string and I tie a knot in it and I just blow and I say Iblis three times and I blow on it, it's not going to do anything. It won't have any effect whatsoever because I worship Allah and I don't worship Iblis. So if a Muslim was to do this, it wouldn't have any effect. But when the magician does that same thing, it has an effect because he is doing it to worship them. He is doing it to call upon them. He is doing it because he understands what I am doing is disbelief, yet I still want to do it. Purposes of magic now. So we've looked at what is magic, we've looked at how is magic done. Now let's look at some of the reasons why magic is performed on another individual. Magic may be performed to make an individual fall in love. Fall in love, okay? So a man, he sees a woman and he does magic on her to make her fall in love or she does magic on him to make him fall in love. I had one case where a sister, she was about 18 years old and a 60 year old man did magic on the sister when she was 18 and he used her to fulfill his desires for 20 years. He was 60. She was a young girl. He did magic on her because he wanted to fulfill his desires upon her. A 60-year-old man on an 18-year-old girl. Or we have the other side. The woman, she wants to take her husband away from the in-laws. He goes to his mom's house too much, doesn't spend enough time with me. So she does magic on him in order to make him fall in love with her and he begins to hate his in-laws. But as I've said, sisters, before you become tempted, understand this, it's disbelief. Understand this, it's going to backfire on you. Understand this, that same man who you tried to make fall in love with you, he's going to end up hating you. Or you're going to end up hating him. This is from the adab of Allah, the punishment of Allah in this life. And then when you meet Allah in Yawm Al-Qiyamah, no questions asked, straight into the fire of hell. The second reason why somebody might do magic is for medicinal reasons, medicinal purposes. So the woman, she can't have babies or she, they are not, Allah has not blessed them with children. So they go to this magician and look subhanallah. And I say this without, you know, any doubt. So I don't want you to doubt. Many of our so-called Mawlanas that we have in our societies are practicing magic. I need you to understand this. Many of our so-called Mawlanas and Shaykhs and these people, they are practicing magic. I need you to understand this. We're going to look at how to identify a magician and I think 95% of us are going to have, to have come across an individual like this in our local masjid. And the people are saying he is, you know, Shaykh Saab. Yet, when we look at how to identify a magician, these people, they tick all of the boxes. Okay, so medicinal reasons, medicinal purposes. So they go to the individual and they say, we can't have children. So he takes her clothes and he goes and he performs that magic. As a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she may get pregnant. As a test from Allah, maybe Allah was testing them by not blessing them with children. Are they going to turn to me or are they going to turn to their enemies? So they go to their enemies and as a test from Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses her with a child. And then she is going to be 100% attached to that magician. 
She's going to say, we did all of the medical route, we did all of the therapies, and we, and we didn't have a child. We went to this individual, he wrote me a da'weez, he told me to do X, Y, and Z. Now, I have a child. The magician, he might do magic for protection. Understand this, protection. You want to protect your house, you've moved into a new home, and you want to protect that house. So you go and he, he writes you something, and he says, put it on the wall, and this is going to protect you. Again, the protection is only from Allah. You need to understand this. Who is the one that protected the Muslims at the Battle of Badr? When there was 309 Muslims fighting over a thousand mushrikeen, did the Prophet ﷺ call upon the devils? No, he called upon Allah. Allah sent down a thousand angels to aid the Muslims against their enemies. Allah is the one who protected the Muslims. Allah protected them at Badr, Allah protected them at Uhud, Allah protected them at all stages. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our protector and our helper. We need to understand this. If we turn to other than Allah in something that only Allah can do, then we have associated partners with Allah. Another type of magic, magic of separation. A magic of separation. Why are they so happy in their marriage? How dare she marry him and not marry me? How dare she come to Pakistan and she doesn't get married to my son? She's never going to get married again or the marriage that she has is going to fail. Jealousy, hatred, envy leads the people to do this type of thing. In this type of situation, they could be you know, in love with one another and they like one another and they get on and they have had no problems whatsoever. Then the magic is done. And subhanallah, I have had situations, a brother rang me and he said, when I look at my wife, I see an animal's head on my wife's shoulders. When I look at my wife, I used to be attracted to her. But now when I look at her, I see an animal's head on her shoulders. Now you tell me, is this type of marriage going to work? The man won't even look at his wife. The wife is going to say, what's wrong? Why don't you look at me? Why don't you get close to me? He's going to say, I don't even want to be in the same house as you. That relationship is going to break down. Likewise, they may not be able to be intimate with one another. This is going to cause a breakdown of the relationship. They may become extremely suspicious of one another. They become argumentative and argue over small things. Look brothers and sisters, some of these signs which I'm mentioning, you might argue with your wife, that doesn't mean you have magic. You might have a wife or the husband might, have, might be a little bit talkative. That doesn't necessarily mean that you argue, it leads to magic. It's magic. We shouldn't be that type of person, we're always suspecting everything is magic, everything is magic. There is also another type of magic, which is magic to kill. Okay, magic to kill. So the individual says, I want this person dead. The magician, this is a horrible type of magic. The magician, he does this type of magic. The jinn, they will usually possess that individual and their aim and their objective, try and get that person to commit suicide. Okay, it's rare. You won't get a situation where you just see a knife come flying through the air and hits you between the eyes. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. The way that the jinn will try and cause that individual to, to die, is through suicide. So they will come to them, whisper to them, say you have a bad life, why don't you just take your life? And they'll try and get that individual to become, uh, to, to commit suicide. Now let's look at some signs and symptoms of being, of being afflicted with magic. How do I know? If I am afflicted, if, I, if I'm worried or I'm concerned, how do I know? It's important to note, and I always put this disclaimer on it, that you may have one of these signs or one of these symptoms that doesn't mean that you are possessed or you have magic or you have evil eye if you suspect something go and ask somebody and speak about your case in detail don't self-diagnose based on these general points okay don't self-diagnose based on these general points what you have to understand is that the symptoms of the magic are going to vary according to why the magic has been done. Okay, so if the magic is to kill you, if the magic is to kill you, your marriage with your wife will be fine. But if, your, if the magic is to destroy you and your wife, then your health will be fine, but your marriage is breaking down. An individual, they may have sudden changes of mood. Sudden changes of mood, especially when the Quran is recited. 
Okay, especially when the book of Allah is recited, it leads to sudden mood changes, sudden mood swings. They go from being extremely happy one second to being extremely angry, extremely uh, violent the next second. A hatred for the adhan, a hatred for the adhan. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, when the adhan is called, shaitan flees. When the adhan is called, shaitan flees. So when the adhan is on TV or you make the adhan in the masjid, if that individual is always leaving, is always leaving, he hates the adhan, this may be an indication that they are possessed, there may be magic involved. Like I mentioned, sudden change of emotions when it comes to the wife. It's really common. When you're apart, you miss her. When you're apart, you miss him. When you're together, you can't stand to be in one another's company. I like a literal genuine hatred, like I want to kill you. Not I'm a little bit, I just feel a bit uneasy or I'm tired today, I've had a hard day at work and, and you're, you're getting on my nerves. No, not like that. But genuinely when I'm apart, I miss you. But when I'm in front of you, I literally want to kill you. This is the type of hatred that we're talking about. Massive changes in personality. Massive changes in personality. And we're not talking, you know, just the way people, they change as they go on through life. Massive changes. So one day, the brother may be a practicing individual. The next morning, he wakes up and he has a hatred for Allah, a hatred for Islam, a hatred for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There may be issues with hygiene. We know that the shayateen, they live in unclean places. Which is why when we enter into the bathroom, it's an unclean place, we make that dua. Because it's an unclean place. So that person, he just goes into the bathroom and sits there for hours and hours and hours on end. Sounds far-fetched, I know. But we do get situations where women, they go and lock themselves in the bathroom for four or five hours at a time. Brothers, they go and do the same thing, three, four, five hours. And what do they say? I feel peace when I am in the bathroom. When I'm in the rest of the house, I feel agitated, angry, upset, fidgety. When I'm in the bathroom, I suddenly feel happy. Other things, these are slightly more extreme now that we're going to mention. You may see a woman's face on a man, or you may see a man's face on a woman. I can't explain that to you, okay? You will only understand if you ever see it. Where you look at a person, and, and it's a man, his eyes are the same, nose is the same, everything is the same, but you see a woman's face on his face. Or you hear a woman talk through a man. Or you hear a man talk through a woman. This is very, very common. So if it's a woman, she's possessed by a male jinn, then the, uh, the woman she will, and the jinn talks, he's going to talk in a man's voice, because it's a man. Or a man is possessed by a female jinn, and they, uh, and they begin to talk in that situation. What's the difference between magic and jinn possession? This is very important. What's the... <coughs> What's the difference between magic and jinn possession? I mentioned to you what the magician says, throw this chicken, throw this salt, throw this blood. What then happens brothers and sisters? The jinn who work for that magician, the jinn who work for that magician, now they're going to come and start hovering around the individual. So say this brother, somebody wants to do magic on this brother, may Allah protect him. Okay, somebody wants to do magic on him. So they go and they give his beard hair, or they give his hat, or they give his sock, or they give a picture of him or whatever it might be. The magician now, he does his obedience to the jinn, and then he says, right, go to his house, put this in his drink, throw this into his garden, whatever. They do that. The jinn now, they have like a homing beacon. They have a homing beacon which they lock onto. That magic, that blood, whatever, is just so the jinn know who to get. Let me give you an example, and I give this example all of the time. In the police camera action videos, they're chasing somebody in the middle of the night, the criminal, he dumps his car and he runs into the middle of the forest. What do they do? They bring their police dogs. They bring their police dogs and they, get, and they smell the person's trail, they smell his scent, and they go and catch that individual. Even if there were 20 people in the forest, they're going to catch that individual because they've got his scent. Likewise with the jinn, they need to know who it is. Which one are we supposed to get? So that's why you have a picture, that's why you have his hair, that's why you have his clothes, that's why you have her jewelry. So that the jinn know which is the one who we're going to get. 
The jinn now hover around this individual. He comes home, he's not feeling all that good. He feels that there's a presence. He feels that there's something around him. He feels that there's something watching him. When she's alone at home, she can feel like breathing down her neck. She feels like something's watching her when she's in the house. They hear movement in the house. The jinn are waiting now. The jinn play a waiting game. This brother, he's a practicing brother, he seeks refuge in Allah. The jinn are hovering around him because they're looking for a weakness. They're looking for that moment of weakness where he forgets Allah. They're looking for that moment of weakness where he doesn't remember Allah or he doesn't make uh, dhikr of Allah or he doesn't seek and, and make those du'as. When he doesn't, when his guard is down, they enter, they enter into the individual. They enter him and they cause him the problems. This is how the magic works. The magician, he sends the jinn. Jinn also possess for two other reasons. The jinn, they fall in love with human beings. Okay, you need to understand this. Jinn can fall in love with human beings. You may have a female jinn who falls in love with a man. He, he's walking one day and they literally just fall in love and possess that individual. And it's like an Indian movie. It's like an Indian movie, it's really pathetic. You make Rukya, the jinn starts to speak and you say, look, why are you in this individual? And she says, I love him. Or he says, I love her. And you say, look, you know, you have your women in your world. We have ours. Leave them alone. No, I'm not going to leave. I've, I, I love him. And we say, look, if you don't leave, we're going to kill you by the permission of Allah. I will die, but I'm not going to leave. It's like an Indian movie, like a pathetic soap opera. I will die, but I won't leave. I will die, but I, I won't leave him. Or I won't leave her. It's ridiculous. Because this is how they fall in love. And this is a reminder to those sisters. When you leave the house, you must have correct hijab. When you leave the house, you shouldn't be wearing perfume. When you leave the house, you shouldn't be caked in makeup. Understand this. Understand this. Because it's not just the men who see you, but the men from amongst the jinn, they also see you. And if you're not protected and you're not covered in the correct way, then you may be opening yourself up to this type of thing. To end, let's look at the signs of a magician. Let's look at the signs of a magician. And really this is the crux. I've given you a brief, very, very brief sort of background concerning magic and how magic is done. But subhanAllah, we did a 12 hour or a 15 hour course on this and we never finished. 15 hours of this same subject and we never finished. Okay, so in one hour I'm not going to get much across to you. But I just wanted to give you the main gist of things. Okay.